you know, yeah, just love what God's doing. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but when, um, whenever God seems to be moving, Satan isn't happy. Um, so if you're feeling attacks from Satan, know that, well, you might be on the precipice of something amazing that God's doing. And it just kind of goes without saying, Satan is always under attack. That's kind of what we were talking about uh, last week in this devotional um, and how Satan was going after the Messiah and couldn't win. And so he turns on to the offspring of the woman and of the baby, right? Being Mary and Jesus. So when you feel those attacks, look up, right? Because God is right there with you. So I don't know. I don't know why I said that. just felt like saying that this morning. So we are in Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13, 1 through 18. Uh, we're going to read all of that today. Just kind of sets the concept of where we're at. So Revelations 13, 1 through 18. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and a great authority." One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for forty-two months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that, that, that is those who dwell in heaven. And it allowed, also it allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb that was slain, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the, with the sword he will be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and the faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it... It is allowed to work in the presence of the beast. It deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it allowed, it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of it. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is 666. The Jews were warned, yet they continued to trust a pagan state to save them and not the Messiah. You know, over the last hundred years, we've seen lots of fascinations with the mark of the beast. Some said it was the ISBN number when that came out on retail and on the back of books. Some that it was credit credit cards, right? Um, yet in Revelations, we see in Revelation that everyone is marked. Everyone is marked. 
Chapter 14, the Lamb was standing with 144,000 who had his name and his fathers written on their foreheads. They were marked. This signified the way they think. There's two types of people. Those who are marked by the devil, and, sh the, and, and, and it shows in the way they think and in the way they act. He can, his control is over them completely. And then there are those who are marked by God, right? Christians, we have the mark of God on our heads, on the way that we think and the way that we act. It's the walk of holiness. We have the ownership of God that he controls us. The high priest in the Old Testament carried a name on his forehead. It's written and it says, holiness unto the Lord. That's why in the holiness church we hold that so sacred. To make sure that God changes the way we think and the way that we act. You're either marked by Satan, the beast, or by the holiness of God. Ezekiel told us that God sent an angel from heaven and he went through the land and, and marked those who belong to God. It, it wasn't a physical mark. It was a spiritual one. We so often are trying to turn this passage into a physical mark of the beast and trying to guess and are fascinated at what it is. And yet it's a mark of the way we think. We could just stop right there and spend the whole day just talking about that, but we won't fully uh, suffice to say who controls your thinking. Is your life, your thinking, and your actions marked by God? Or are they marked by sin? Are, are your waking moments controlled by sin? Or are you learning in this journey of grace to surrender to the control and lordship, the sanctification, the all-in, whatever you want to call it, being marked by God. Because he is in control of your life. In Genesis, we read of a mark of Cain. The mark of Cain, was it a physical mark? Or was it, could others see it? We don't really know. Or was it just a mark spiritually? Because you realize, and I mean, it doesn't take much to think. I, I've met individuals that I've, um, well, I, I've wondered how old they were. The, the mark of a, as we would say, a tough life. It's a life of sin. Heavy smoking, addiction, those type of things. The, the mark was on them, and I would have guessed they were in their 70s, and they were younger than I was. I've seen 20 and 30 year olds that look like they were 60 and 70. That sin has a mark that it leaves on us, right? It's not always just a physical, but it's a physical, it's emotional, it's spiritual. And God, in the reverse of that, marks his own. He seals us. Ephesians tells us that Christians, as Christians, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, we are marked by God. So whose mark is on your thinking? Verse 18 the, says this calls for wisdom. The number is the number of a man, the number of the beast. It symbolizes he whose number is 666. And again, that fascination with this number and, and to the point of a spiritualism about it. I know in retail, working in Christian retail, I would have people who their their cost or their chain, if their amount equaled 666, they'd have to buy something else because they just couldn't pay it. <laughs> That's superstition. That's all it is. Revelation tells us it's a man. A man who is evil. A, a man with great authority. We too often make the mistake of trying to affix this number, this symbol of the Antichrist to just about anybody that we hate. Really. Look at who you voted for and the other person is the Antichrist. We form an Antichrist of the Month Club. Remember though, Antichrist has never used that term in the entire book of Revelation. It was used in 1 John 1 verse. And guess what it says? It's a spirit of the Antichrist that was among them, even right then when John was writing. 
It's not one person bringing out about the end of the world. It was a spirit of being in rebellion to the things of Christ. That is the Antichrist. Not, well, Gorbachev, right? I, some said that that birthmark was a sign of the beast. <laughs> uh, Ronald Reagan, because, well, all three of his names were six digits. It's not... Obama or Trump or Biden or or um, uh, Khrush, you know Khrushchev, right? Wasn't that the guy's name that um, uh, you know in, in Russia years ago? And people thought because he stood up and said there is no God, and uh, not Henry Kissinger. We've affixed so many names to the Antichrist. I've even heard people say that well, it's going to be King Charles whoever followed. Um, some said it would be the Pope, right? I mean, they're always affixing this title to people and they're missing. They're missing it. This wasn't written to us. It was written to a first century church. It had to be somebody that they would recognize. It was written to them to explain why they were over, being overcome by persecution. Because the beast was behind the empire and the voice of the empire. The Caesar. The Nero. You know why you're going through this, you would say. It's due to 666 is basically what he just told them. But what if John said Satan is behind this person that won't come for 2,000 years? Would that have been hope for an early church? Absolutely not. Do, do you see how we have been taught this incorrectly in an American church because of C.I. Schofield and Hal Lindsey and the books that sell? It doesn't work, but it has to make sense to an early church reader. Latin, Greek, and Hebrew all had numeric values. We've talked about this numerous times. We don't always understand that because we have numbers, but they didn't. Each letter had a number. We don't take A, B, C, and D and add it up unless you're doing high algebra or something. And even then, that doesn't make sense, right? Not everybody understands that. But in their day, everybody understood the numerical. That's why in Pompeii, it was written on a wall, I love her whose name is 545, and they knew what their names were. We don't understand this as much today, but they did. They knew the numeric value. They knew this was Nero, the Caesar. No one talked in English, so our solution can't be in English. There have been those who have tried to do a Bible code and gone through an English Bible and done all these little crossword puzzle type things and pulled out Hitler's name and all. You know. No. It wasn't in Hebrew, you can't, or in English, you can't do that. The solution had to be in that original language, in the Greek or the Latin and the Hebrew. In Nero, Nero in Latin, because you do realize Latin was around even back then. It, it predates uh, um, the Roman Empire. So in Latin, Nero is spelled with an N on the end, Neron. And guess what? N in Latin equals 50. E is a 6. R uh, equals 500. O is 60. And N is 50, right? So what does that equal? That equals 666. Six, six. If we go into another language and, and you go into, uh, uh, into that, the, the Greek language at that time, Nero Caesar. Those letters equal out to 666. And guess what? In both of them, it's Neron. And if you drop the N in both of them, the total would be 616. No other name could you look in two languages and find the same numerical value and also find the same numerical value with dropping that letter of N just to Nero. It had to be Nero. The emperor who started this persecution against them, who, who was very demonic. We can read Josephus and so many other historians that uh, really talk against Nero. And the demonic nature into which he lived. And the, well, like Saul, he, he ends up going nearly insane towards the end. We've heard the strange and the bizarre when it comes to Revelation for so long that, well, we begin to 
when we come to a common sense understanding, we begin to think that's strange because we've heard these weird things for so long. Well, the ten horns uh, represent the European Union. And when that took place, well, it, actually before it was the United Nation, but then that didn't happen and that didn't end the world. So therefore, now it had to be the European Union, which, well, as you know, is kind of falling apart thanks to Brexit and so many others. I, it just, that's not the end of the world. We miss the point because we keep trying to read it. We, we're looking for the strange. We're fascinated with it. And yet the common sense it has been what has been accepted for thousands of years. Good morning, Pat. Has been the accepted understanding for so long in the academic world, in the scholastic world. It has been the understanding of what I'm teaching. It makes the most sense, but the sensational sells the most books. We've live in generations that have gotten their theology from the likes of individuals who really liked selling books. How Lindsay has made a fortune. And yet even how Lindsay has changed much of what he originally said. It's no longer helicopters that start the World War Four. That, that locust and that's that me. I mean, he's changed so many different times. They've made predictions that have not come true. And remember, what is the um, what is the the test of a prophet in the Old Testament? It is said, if anything they say that is of God does not come true, then they are a false prophet. And yet we continue to listen. Why? Because the sensational cells. We're fascinated with the sensational. Most of those books, though, end up in the bargain bin in just a few months. They miss the mark and claim an antichrist who dies. Ronald Reagan forgot he was the antichrist. You know, I, we, we constantly see this. All because they don't look at the early church. Nero... Well, he's turning against you, and he's persecuting you. He's the voice of this great beast, and guess who's behind him? The devil. Hold on. Be faithful, because this is just a small time. God knows. He sees you. He cares, and he's still in control. Even when the devil seems to be in control, God is always on the throne. That's what John was speaking, that the beast was Rome and Nero was the second beast, the voice of. And this mark, this mark was the phrase Caesar is Lord. It was bowing down to the state, to that empire. And if John had just said this, well, it had been a treason. He'd be treasonous and the message would have been destroyed. It would have never gotten out. So he was writing to an underground church not to incite insurrection against the governments, but patience and long-suffering, those fruits of the Spirit. Insurrection is never the answer. He was seeking patience. The kingdom was here. Spiritually, it was overthrowing all other kingdoms before it. You see, we have a mark. We have a mark that we are gods, citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Have you ever been around somebody and you go, oh, they've got to be a believer. And you just go, what church do you go to? You just, you just know by the way they act and the way they live. That mark is on them. The mark is not your social security number, as some said when that first came out and refuse to take a number. It's not a barcode. It's not some chip that will be implanted in us all. Um, it's not some crazy ring that holds our financial data. It's none of that. It's not convenience. It's spiritual. Often the people pushing these crazy fanatic things are... Uh, generally more spiritualist than they are Christian and not the ones truly following Christ. They get all upset and make an issue over something small. This mark, the apostasy, 
the trusting of the empire over God. That's what the mark truly was. And it was spiritual, not convenience. It's refusing to trust Christ and only his teaching. Don't be scared of a number. That's just superstition. Don't be scared of Friday the 13th or breaking a mirror or anything that the world tells us to be scared of. None of that matters. Only the teachings of Christ. Be scared of not following Christ. Don't panic over the, the number, right? When we're living in sin. Take care of the sin. Take care of the heart issue. Follow after Christ. It's, it's not wrong to want to make sense of what Revelation is saying to us. But when we begin to take things that are today and things of the newspaper and try to shoehorn them into the book of Revelation, that's when it's wrong. That's when it's false. May we always look to God's word first to see what he has to say in all things, not what feels good. It's not what makes me happy. Not what somebody else has said. You know, I've said this all the time from the pulpit. Don't take my word for it. Take God's word for it. Just because I say it, don't trust it. Just because an early church father said it doesn't mean we trust it. Does it line up with God's word? This is what keeps us from falling astray to new theology. If the church hasn't believed it in 2,000 years, something might be amiss. May we always be discerning and using God's word as our foundation for that discernment. So Holy Spirit, God, I, I just pray the world is so full of superstition. We follow after that more than we do even you. So God, change our hearts. Remove from us the superstition. Remove from us the preferences so that we might be grounded in your word. God, the fascination with the fanatical and the superstition that so often is shoehorned and read into revelation make us discerning discerning of your word to shake up the cobwebs that doesn't mean that because some preacher preached it wrong no it doesn't doesn't mean that they were wrong and everything they said is wrong and we ought to challenge everything no so we ought to always look into god's word because it's so easy to take a fascination with revelation and turn it into a message that we are still waiting for the kingdom to be established. And yet that kingdom is here. We can live in victory over sin because the kingdom is here. If the kingdom is not established, then we have no victory. We are without hope, waiting, longing. And many have died waiting but yet Simeon saw the kingdom Anna prophesied the kingdom and Jesus testified that the kingdom of God was here he was fulfilled in him he is reigning in control at the right hand of the father Satan is a wounded beast and it's death rose we as believers in this church, the church, the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. May we live in victory, not defeat. Because that is not, defeat is not the message of the Bible. It is not the message of the cross. And it is not the message of Revelation. May we get it right. Because the world's counting on us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, go in peace and have a great rest of the afternoon.